Good morning. I will be reading 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Share in, sufferings, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. All right. One of the things I really love about our God is his attributes. The attributes of God are amazing. His mercy, his grace, his patience, they're beyond our comprehension, truly, the, our full comprehension. One that I, I really uh, want to focus on today is his wisdom. His wisdom to give us all these different images of who he is, who Jesus our Lord is, and who we are. We can relate when we're given an image that we're familiar with. We're told that our God is our creator, master of the universe, king above all kings. And those are hard to relate to for some of us. But when he tells us he is our father, then we can start to relate. When he is our shepherd, when he is the door that we can walk through, then he is the way to life. When he is the water of life, we begin to relate to that. Every time I hear the, word, the term water of life, there's a specific memory that pops in my mind. When I was a young child, we were hauling hay in the fields in the summer in Missouri, and it was ferocious hot. And I remember being so thirsty. And the water I drank that day never tasted so good as that day. That's interesting to have something like that stick in your mind. I was probably eight or nine years old, and boy, my uncles were working me hard, like mercilessly. And finally, I got that drink of water, and I, I'll never forget that. And that's the memory that pops in my mind when I hear the words water of life. It really means something to me. But who we are, we're given all these images that are so impressive. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. But we are also children, and we're sheep. But... Today, I want to talk about one that maybe some of you relate well to and others do not. We are soldiers. And we have no option at this point. If you are in the body of Christ, you are a soldier. So it's really important we know what that means. I didn't used to know what that meant totally. And I, I will tell you, you may not fully comprehend it as well as others. I'd love to see a show of hands, people who have served in the military. All right, take a quick look around. And if you have a question about some of the things we talk about today, don't fully understand, ask one of them. I know you're gonna hear some old war stories, but they're worth hearing. I did not. <laughs> I did not totally understand what it meant to be in the military until I was in the military. I have my father who served in the Air Force, four brothers of his, of my uncles, all served in the military. And I kind of knew what that meant to some degree, but it, it totally changed when I was in the Army. Almost exactly 35 years ago today, I was preparing to enlist to go. I was already signed up. I was packing to go. And, and it opened my eyes immensely to what some of these things in Scripture meant about being a soldier of Christ. There are a lot of reasons people join the military and become soldiers. Some of them, it's patriotism. Uh, after 9-11, there were a lot of people who joined the military who would never have thought of it before. But because of the imminent threat to our nation, they needed for within themselves to go and protect our country. For me, back in the late 80s, married with two children, 
The economy was not great. I thought, wow, I need more skills and I need a job, a better job. I had a job, but I need something better. So I joined the military for the training and for the job. Some people, that's all it is. I want to go in and learn a skill, and I'm willing to serve in the military to get that skill that I want. Some people, it's a sense of purpose. I just don't know what I'm doing with life. Maybe if I go into military, I'll find a purpose. Some people, this one is, eludes me, but I actually had guys I was in the service with, and this was their reason. I just couldn't do it myself, so I'm here to get physically fit. That's pretty drastic to me. I was like, but some people, that's what they want to do. Our son joined the military after working in the secular world a few years. We, he did College wasn't his thing. He said, I'm going to go in the military and get the GI Bill, and then my college will be paid for later. A lot of people do that. Some folks just want to go in because they know they'll be able to save money while they're in the military. Some, it's the stability. Others go in and think, I'm going to go in, and I don't think this is the case anymore. It was when I was there 20 years, and you're out, and you retire. I think you have to go longer than that now, but they... That's a, a pretty admirable goal to be able to look and say, well, I, I'm going to do this for 20 years and then I'll retire. But there's all these reasons to become a soldier and they vary. And you know what? None of those is the wrong reason. A lot of people uh, think, well, there's only one reason to become a Christian soldier. And I don't think that's correct either. I, I think it's a, a, a bit of all. Uh, I don't think any of them should be your only reason. But some people, I just have to be saved from sin. To get those sins washed away, I'll become a Christian soldier. And that's fine. And that's admirable. And that's definitely a big part of it. There are others. I don't think this is the best reason. But they are so afraid of going to hell for eternity, they will become a Christian. Now, that might be a good starting point, but you sure need to grow from there. And if that's where you are, that's okay. If you're, a, if you're here to avoid hell, okay. But you need to know there, it's so much better than just that. Amen. Some people do become Christians to find purpose. And that's absolutely true. Some do it because they want to learn God's will. And they jump in both feet. I want to do what God wants me to do. It's more a sense of duty than anything. They don't under, quite understand the passion, the love for Scripture, but they know they want to do what God wants them to do. They recognize Him as their Creator. I'm in to do what God wants me to do. Same thing. I think you will grow in your life if that <clears throat> is your starting point. Many of us, it is. It's a love for God. I love what God has done for me even before I become a Christian, they recognize how much he has blessed their life. And they give their life to him because of that. And some people, it's a love of this faith in Christ Jesus. That this church that Christ built and the wisdom and love and sacrifice he gave to make it possible. There's all these reasons to become a Christian soldier. And I think uh, at least a portion of all of those should be incorporated into why we do what we do to serve God. So he gives us this image of a soldier, just one of the images of what it means to be a Christian. In this country, conscription has been a part of our history. Never has it been a part of God's history. God never conscripts us into his army. Always volunteers. We have always been a volunteer army. And there's something admirable about that in our nation, but essential in God's army. He will not conscript us. Conscription is kind of a scary thing, and hopefully uh, you haven't been a part of that, but I'm almost certain there are a few in this building right now who were conscripted into service. It's not the best way. That's not how you usually get the best soldiers. If you read the bulletin article, you, you saw a, just a tiny bit of Roman history 
Initially, Roman soldiers were conscripted. And, and that was, uh, it was rough because these were property owners with means, with farms, vineyards, and they did everything at their own expense to serve the nation. And sometimes they were gone for many, many years, and when they returned, they were poverty-stricken because their farms, their vineyards had been neglected all that time, or maybe even taken over by someone else, and they returned with nothing. In our history, it's happened six times in the United States. Don't know if you're aware of this, the Revolutionary War, soldiers were conscripted. During the Civil War, soldiers were conscripted. World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, and Vietnam. Now, in the United States, it wasn't always as extreme as the Romans. They didn't have to do everything at their own expense. You didn't show up and they said, well, where's your uniform and your weapons? You got to bring those too at your own expense. We didn't do that as a nation. Those were provided, but it has been done. Thankfully, they don't do that anymore. The last draft call in the United States was December 7th. Isn't that interesting? 1972. And the, uh, the authority to do that expired in June of 1973. So now our nation is all a volunteer army. But that should be familiar to us because we are a volunteer army. Now, the previous military versus current military, I'm not really up on what's happening in the Army these days. I've kind of lost track. But back when I was in, I learned some really interesting things about what it meant to be a soldier. And I know it's not the same today because of what I hear about in the news. Soldiers are, now I don't want to get into politics of COVID, but this is just what's happening in our world versus what happened when I was in. And I'll, I'll explain. And you'll find it humorous because I do. Today, soldiers say, nope, I'm not taking the COVID vaccine. Now, when I was in, we didn't even get asked. <laughs> we went in, we raised our right hand, we swore an oath to defend this country, and part of defending this country was I don't get diseases. So I got in a line of other soldiers with a whole bunch of people on each side with these guns attached to stuff. And we walked along and they went, honk, honk, honk. We got shot after shot after shot. And then we got a couple of days to recover because we felt awful. There was no option. And I know now why that was the case. A little bit later, a couple of friends of mine in the military, they had the weekend pass. They went to the beach and they got really sunburned. So sunburned, they were sick, which meant they couldn't do their job. They couldn't report to work. They received Article 15s, which is judicial punishment. They were punished for having a sunburn. And the reason was destruction of government property. They were government property. And when I saw that and heard that happen, I went, oh, that explains a lot. Now, there is a correlation between us as Christian soldiers and that mentality. We belong to God. We are not our own. And that does change the way we respond to the things that we do in our life. We know that uh, this is a, a scripture is full of, of references about soldiers. And this was one of the more difficult sermons I put together, not as in because it was a hard subject, but my process is I gather every bit of information I can about this topic, and then I start whittling it down. And another couple of hours, we'll be down, finished with what I got down to. Just kidding. What I did realize was I found this so fascinating and there's such a, a vast amount of information. We're really gonna just scratch the surface today. This may very likely in the future become a Wednesday night class. There is so much information and it is so interesting to see what God says about his Christian soldiers and what we're supposed to do. 
I want to read uh, Acts chapter 22, verses 25 through 29, when Paul is giving his defense, and they're about to discourage, about to scourge him. Um, <clears throat> it brings up a really fascinating point, and you may not see the connection at first, but I'll bring it to you. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. The commander came to Paul and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, now you have to understand he's now taking it a step up. And he says, but I was actually born a Roman citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him, that means beat him, immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman because he had put him in chains. There are privileges to citizenship in Rome. In Paul's day and time, you did not do what they just did to a Roman citizen. And there were three steps of, Ro of Roman citizen. Natural born, which Paul was. He was a first class Roman citizen. Even though he was a Jew, he was born a Roman citizen. You could buy your citizenship with a huge amount of money. And it was so valuable to be a Roman citizen that people did. And this Roman commander had done that. So this Roman commander hadn't done the third step. His, many of the Roman citizens in the first century, or soldiers, they enlisted in the military because after they served, they were granted Roman citizenship. That's how precious it was. They would go into service simply to become a citizen of Rome. And there were those stages. So here's what I think is so interesting about this. There is this correlation. They had to serve many years upon completion of their service, they were granted citizenship. In God's army, instant citizenship when we become his soldiers. There are, I'm sure, some brothers and sisters in here with us today who have become citizens of the United States from another country. And, and if you don't know who they are, do a little asking and find out, and then ask them about that process. It is arduous. It's, it's not easy to become an American citizen. Most of us in here naturally born. We take a great deal for granted. In, Paul, in Paul's day, it, it was a very important thing. It's not quite that way for American citizens in, in the world today, but it used to be a lot bigger thing to be an American citizen. But Paul tells us about this too. In Philippians chapter three and verse 20, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven, for, from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are citizens. When we become a Christian, there's that another image that we are told we are. We're citizens. That means we have all the privileges of being a citizen of God's kingdom. In John 10, verses 28 and 29, it says, Jesus said these words, I give them eternal, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one able, is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. There, there's some security. Jesus says it can't happen. A lot of things might happen to us. Ashby talked about the persecution that's mentioned in 1 Peter 4 in the auditorium class today. 
And there's a lot of uh, very difficult things that have happened to our brothers and sisters in the past and are happening in the world today around the world. Christians being persecuted. But the one thing that cannot happen is we cannot be taken out of the hand of our Lord. Soldiers are cared for. We're provided for. As God's children, as God's soldiers, think of the blessings we are given. As a soldier, when I was in the military, it was funny. I found it interesting. I was worried about signing up, being married, having two children, and the possibility of being gone for extended periods of time, which sometimes I was. Especially at the beginning, going to basic training and all that. What I worried about was, how, how is my family going to handle this? Well, you know what? They handled it really well. Because we were provided for. When at the end, I was stationed at Fort Huachuca down in Sierra Vista. Base housing. Three-bedroom home. Everything provided. Even basic cable. The only thing we didn't have was we had to pay for our telephone. And if you wanted to upgrade to the, your cable to bigger things, you had to pay for that. But can you, I, I still have a hard time understanding that. Uh, just because I'm a soldier, I had a place in a gated community. <laughs> fully provided for. Medical, fully covered. No premiums. No deductibles, no co-pays. It was awesome. And then we had separate rations. They gave us grocery money. Can you believe it? They really did. It, we kind of lived high on the hog for a few years and didn't even really realize it. Now, Lynn loved that security. I wasn't so keen on it because I knew I was government property, and that bothered me. I never had a problem. I never did. There were times they would ask us to be uh, at some kind of a duty or a work thing, uh, just you know, get together and we gotta clean up the area, do some painting, whatever. And sometimes they would schedule that on Sundays. And I had a problem with that. So I went in and very respectfully said, can I come in another time? I'm not trying to get out of the duty. I'll come in and do it. But can I please not do it during that time? I want to be at worship. Without fail. Not a problem. And never once did they make me come in another time. Because they knew I was serious. I wasn't trying to get out of work. But I had to ask. Can you imagine having to ask to be able to go worship. But it worked out okay, but it still bothered me. So I had a difficulty being government property because I knew I was God's property too and first. It, was, it made it difficult for me. But soldiers are, prepared, are provided for. In 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, now Paul's talking more specifically about him and Barnabas preaching and teaching in Corinth. And his point was, we had every right to be paid. So he's kind of talking about paying the minister or preacher or evangelist. But the principle remains the same, and he draws in this image. This tells us in the first century, people were not conscripted into the army. He says there, who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? So he's making a point to them. And what he, if you know that story, they did not charge them. They didn't make the Corinthians pay them while they were there preaching. That's one of those points where they worked on their own and provided for themselves. But Paul says, we had that right. And he's using that image. A soldier is provided for. Now, we, I know a lot of us, we, we talk about in this world, you know, we, our secular jobs or whatever it is we've done, we realize, well, yes, I went and put in effort uh, and I get paid from that job. 
but who provided that job. I assure you, God put you in that position, allowed you to have that. God provides all these things. Uh, to me, it's, it quite often crosses my mind that it, it tells us everything is held together by the power of his word. God is very active every instant of our life. If God turned his attention away from his creation for a split second, it would fly apart. Scientists are studying all these smallest parts of atoms, electrons, neutrons, and then talk about the quarks. And, uh, you know, it starts getting into things I don't pay that much attention to. But as much as they know, they still don't understand why an atom stays together. They don't know. We know. It's God's word. Holds it together. And the moment he turns away and says, I'm not paying attention to that anymore, it all flies apart. I'm telling you, God provides every single thing you have. Every breath you take, every beat of your heart is because God has provided for us. So becoming a soldier. Well, as Christians, we have to die to ourselves. And we have to follow our commander who died. So we must die to ourselves. As he was buried, we are buried in the waters of baptism. As he was raised by the power of the Father, we so too are raised to this new life. We have to do what our commander did. We have to follow what he has done. And we become at that same moment citizens of heaven and soldiers of Christ. But there are privileges and responsibilities of what we have. Soldiers can go places civilians cannot. You can't just go drive onto any military base. Try it. <laughs> you can get on there, but you can't just drive in like a soldier does. They have a little sticker on their car, and they know, oh, he's okay. They'll wave, they'll wave the soldiers through. You have to pull off to the side and explain what you're doing there. And they might or might not let you in. Soldiers get to go to places uh, for entertainment that civilians can't. One of the coolest things I ever experienced in my life was going to the movies when I was in the Army on an Army base. And I'm sure they still do this. The beginning of the movie, you better stand up and put your hand on your heart because they're going to play the national anthem and the flag is going to fly on the screen. You don't watch a movie until after you've played the national anthem. I thought that was awesome. And everybody did it. And then you get to enjoy your movie. You get to go to those grocery stores they call the PX. They cost less. They give you things there. Soldiers have all those benefits. One of the wonderful things I thought was terrific uh, and a good lesson for me as well, when I first went into basic training, now I wasn't poor. We weren't well off, but I wasn't poor. I thought I was. I met some poor people. One of the fellows in my company and basic training was from Kentucky and he was poor. He was so thrilled when we got our uniforms and our boots. He said, this is the first pair of new boots I've ever had in my life. Can you imagine? And he was in his 20s. First pair of new boots or shoes he'd ever had in his life. But because he was willing to be a soldier, he was provided for. Learning skills. It's impressive to find out the things we learn in the military. I have the job I have today because of my training in the military. There's no doubt about it. Zero. So I, I, I definitely gained. I tell people all the time, I have, I have gained more from that time in the military than I'll ever be able to pay back. So there are these wonderful benefits. Doing some of the chores, we've all heard about them. Painting rocks, digging holes. I did that. I have painted rocks and I have dug holes that I filled in and dug somewhere else. And at the time, I did not get it. There is a purpose. Later, after I'd complained with everyone else, why are we digging this hole? We're just going to fill it back in and dig another one. And we did. That's exactly what we did. But you know what? 
Now, I didn't have to do go into battle. I, I thankfully never went into battle. But there are men and women who are alive today because they got the strength, the stamina, and the experience of digging a hole. Because you get out there and bullets are flying and bombs are dropping, you dig a hole. It's called a foxhole. We all have heard of that. That's why they take you in basic training and make you dig a hole and fill it back in so that you know you can do it later when you really have to. Now, painting rocks is a different thing. You don't have to go out in the battlefield and paint rocks. But part of that is to learn to do what you're told because sometimes we do things that we don't understand why. There are scriptures in scripture in the Bible, and I read them, and I just, I, I don't understand what that is or why God would want me to do it this way. Hopefully we'll learn someday, and there have been many occasions in my life as I have matured and I go, oh, now I understand, I get it. There is a great deal of wisdom in the things that God tells us to do that sometimes we don't understand. The whole plan of salvation from a human standpoint, it doesn't make sense. And the Bible even admits that. Paul even talks about that. They call it foolishness. We wouldn't come up with a plan like that, but God in his wisdom does. And he needs soldiers that will do what he says. I'm kind of hardcore a lot of times about things like that. And I know my kids will attest to this. Sometimes, why do I have to do this? Because I said so. You've probably said that if you had kids, even if you grew up saying, I'll never say that to my kids. <laughs> there comes a point where you're just like, why do I have to do this? Because I said you do. Ultimately, now God wants us to love him, to do things joyfully. He tells us that. He wants us to give cheerfully. He wants us to do things without grumbling and complaining. In my mind, though, sometimes I think, I don't feel like it, but God said to, so I'm just going to do it. I really do feel like in the back of my mind, God just wants us to do it. Now, he wants us to do it happily and without grumbling and complaining. But when it all comes to it, at the end of time and judgment, I think there will be some people he's going to say, I just wanted you to do it. I wanted you to be happy about it, but you wouldn't do it. And they will say, oh, well... We didn't want to. to. Well, guess what? They'll have to answer for that. But we have so many wonderful things. Why be a Christian soldier? Well, James 3.17 says, But the wisdom from above, it's not negative. It's not to beat us down. It is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. Oh, isn't that nice? Boy, yeah. oh, we see hypocrisy all the time. And it's so hard to deal with because you, the uncertainty. God gives us all these good things with good motivation, and it's for our own good. Haven't we all told, I remember seeing things when I was younger, oh, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And then I got that spanking and thought, no, it didn't. It hurt me more. But as a parent, I learned that is. There were times I spanked my children and I really didn't want to. But they needed to learn a lesson. And it, I think there were times that hurt me more than it hurt them. And with God, I think it's the same way. Look at what God has done for us. God has hurt more than any of us when he gave his son. What commander would give his life for his soldiers? There are some. Ours definitely, not only will, but did. Amazing. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not a single thing has been withheld. Spiritual blessings, we have all of them. And we don't even know what they are, but we have them all. <laughs> I think that's amazing. 
In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 10, Paul tries to get a point across to the Corinthians too. Not so much from the idea of a soldier, but it is there, that concept. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? We are God's. So what is required of a soldier? Well, I, it was amazing to me when I first started digging through scriptures about being a soldier. And some of them were Old Testament warfare, the kings and their swords. And think there are hundreds and hundreds of scriptures about soldiering in the Bible. Jesus dealt with a man who was a soldier, who came to ask a favor of Jesus, even though he wasn't a Jew. And in Matthew 8 and verse 9, he makes a statement that Jesus found very impressive. He said, I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And another one, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. That's where we are as soldiers. We're not always good soldiers, are we? I'm not. There are times I think, yeah, uh, Jesus would say, go do this, and I don't. I'm like, oh, that's going to be so hard. I'm so tired. Someone else can do it. You know, I didn't do that when I was in the army. When it's right in front of you, they say, go do it. I was like, yes, drill sergeant. Yes, first sergeant. Yes, sir. That's it. That was my answer. And I'd go and do it, even if I didn't like it. Well, that's who we have. Jesus is our commander of the universe. And he tells us to do things. We know we should. Jesus is baffled sometimes, I think, by our response to him. In Matthew 7 and verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter it. One time, Peter responded that way. Jesus said, I have to go to the cross. Paraphrased. Peter said, oh, no, Lord. No, Lord? Not so, Lord? No, we're not going to let that happen. Can you imagine a commander coming out to his soldiers and saying, we're going to take that hill? And they go, no, we're not. That's what Peter did. No, no, we're not letting that happen. But it happened. And he learned his lesson. Yeah, Jesus, some, I think in some ways, of course, it, it's, it's this perspective so that we kind of get the point. In Luke six forty six, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It, there's not an equal sign there. It should be equal. If we call him Lord, we should do what he says. We are soldiers of Christ. But it doesn't have to be a bad thing. In Roman times, there were soldiers who went to war with a a general. And they had a passion because they had a good general. He was a good leader. He cared for his soldiers. He got them the best of everything he could provide. Provided for their retirement even. But there were soldiers who stayed with their generals when they could have gone home. Because they loved the general. That's the general we have. Now we don't do an enlistment term unless you call it life. When we sign on, we sign on for life. You're a soldier till the end. Whether we die in service to our Lord or just run out of time. We get to serve the Lord till the end and get all the benefits all the way through and then oh what a retirement we have. But you know, I think often of the imagery in the book of Revelation that John saw. So often, it it actually bothers me when I see a lot of the pictures, the artist pictures of Jesus. Kind of, I don't know, fair skin and beautiful hair and 
the glowing robe and the, you know, the, the beams on him. And, I mean, those are beautiful images. But from another perspective, I like what John saw. Jesus on a stallion with eyes of fire and a flaming sword. Now there's a victorious general for you. Have, do you have these memories when you were a child of times you had to face a bully or something like that was going on? And if you were there by yourself, kind of, uh-oh, what am I going to do? But if you had your crew behind you, your gang was with you, even just your bigger brother or an uncle or somebody, how brave could you be when the guy behind you was this big? You know, you, it, it, the bravery goes off the scale when you have support. We should not have an ounce of fear, not an ounce. And I challenge you to drive the fear out of your life because you have Jesus behind you on a white stallion with flaming eyes and a flaming sword, the host of heaven and your fellow soldiers. They're all behind you. I, I too, like Jeff mentioned during the communion, we feel like we're on, on the edge of something great, and I, I think that too. It's time for the soldiers of Christ to arise and serve our Lord as a good soldier. And if you're not a soldier of Christ, there are so many reasons to be. If you want to come to Christ today, follow that path that our Lord set of death to yourself, burial in that water of resurrection to a new life. I want to encourage you to do that today. And if you need to recommit your life, please do. It's a decision that we each have to make within ourselves to serve as we've been called. Won't you do that today while we stand together and sing? Soldiers of Christ, arise!